Well, Mari, what a pleasure to have you this morning. We're so grateful that you're here with us. And um, as my um, co-worker and sister in Jacksonville, it's an honor to be with you this morning. It's a real honor to be here. Thank you. I feel as if uh, today we need to focus on two women, neither of them me. Uh, obviously, you have led an incredible life. But before we get to you, I want to talk about this woman, Jessie Ball DuPont, who you are the president of the Jessie Ball DuPont Fund. And Jessie Ball DuPont was an Episcopalian, right? And, uh, and a remarkable woman of her day who did something with her assets that was um, very forward thinking for her time. So tell us a little bit about Jessie Ball DuPont. And, and as Episcopalians, uh, I've always thought that a will is, is sort of like a love letter to the world that you can leave when you die. And she certainly did something remarkable. So tell us about her life. Absolutely. So Jessie Ball DuPont. Uh, was indeed an Episcopalian, although I discovered um, after reading her biography a little more closely, she used to be a Baptist. Oh. Just lest that disturb any of you out there. <laughs> uh, and she underwent a quiet uh, conversion to Episcopalianism under Bishop Juhan fairly late in her life. Good for her. But she, <laughs> she saw the light, clearly. <laughs> Um, she was a third wife of Alfred I. DuPont, DuPont of, you know, sort of gunpowder chemicals uh, fame, Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, she was 39 when she got married to Alfred and a vice principal of a school out in California at the time. Um, the ball in her name is of a very storied uh, Virginian family, blue blood. Um, uh, you may recall that uh, there's a Mary Ball Washington and George Washington's family tree. That's the same Ball family. So um, she was a professional woman and soon became Alfred's business partner, confidant. And she had, been, she had become a philanthropist long before she got married to Alfred. She, she was an educator and she had begun funding scholarships because she believed firmly that education was an escalator for social and economic mobility and put her money where her mouth was. So fast forward, um, Alfred passes away. She sets up a bunch of uh, charitable institutions in his name, uh, the Alfred I. Testamentary Trust, the Alfred I. DuPont Foundation, the Alfred I. Awards Foundation. Then she takes her own money and puts it, as you say, in a will and dedicates it to charitable purposes. Um, there are some 300 plus organizations named in her will that she has said we should continue to feel free to support, as well as some uh, other needs, which uh, focus on the uh, states of Virginia, Delaware, and Florida. And I think, you know, as you say, it's a love letter to the future. And you have to parse what that letter is saying, right? So, you know, what, what should we really be doing today with Jesse's assets? Um, and from her biography and from the fact that she said in her will, we could use her money in the states of Virginia, Florida, and Virginia. We deduce that place mattered a lot to her. And I think you can deduce that even from her life. There's a place here in Jacksonville called Epping Forest. It's a country club now. It was her estate. And she called it Epping Forest because there was an Epping Forest in Virginia in the Northern Neck where she lived. So place mattered a lot to her. She believes. She believed, I think, that place made people. So we have taken that and said, well, if places make people, let's make the places that Jesse loved as inclusive, prosperous, creative as we can make them. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you mentioned to me when we were talking earlier, though, is that Jesse Ball DuPont was also a product of her time, which was a racist time. Yes. 
And so how do we take a legacy and open it up when it wasn't, when she couldn't see it the yes. way we see it now? How have you taken that legacy and interpreted it in the new awakenings of the present day? Yeah, and so to, you know, it, as you say, she was, she was uh, very much a product of a racist time. She was active in institutions like the University at the South in opposing integration. Uh, she was instrumental in founding a number of segregation academies. I don't know how familiar you are with that term, but these are private schools that popped up in the 1960s primarily in reaction to Brown versus Board of Education. And so, you know, I've thought deeply about what that means. You know, I'm a Japanese woman. I am not. I'm, in fact, fresh off the boat. I only became a citizen three years ago. This is not deep in my own uh, consciousness. But I have thought of what Jessie did and how she may have, in fact, she probably did definitively prevent many people from achieving their full potential expressly by creating such institutions as segregation academies, specifically by refusing to let the institutions she gave money to, such as Sewanee, integrate. And, you know, we had a, we've had conversations at the board about, well, you know, should we be looking at Jesse's legacy and saying, we repudiate her legacy such that we won't even be called the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund. We did not take that decision. So we bear her name. And to me, there's a significance in bearing her name. I'm not Jesse, but I feel like I am responsible for redeeming her reputation, mm -hmm. for carrying out acts of redemption and penance, as it were, for what she may have done through her philanthropic influence. You know, philanthropy is considered to be a good thing, but she used that philanthropic influence to prevent access to opportunities to so many people just on the basis of race. And I was here yesterday at the keynote, and you probably all heard John Meacham talk about the soul of America and how there's individual redemption and then there is the redemption of the soul of America. And I feel a little bit like that about the fund. You know, I am not Jesse. I simply head up an institution that bears her name. But I feel like the, as an institution, we have a unique opportunity to make up for what she may have done as an individual. And what is so beautiful, Mari, is that you have been called, you are the person to do this. Uh, I wanna ask you a little bit to tell everyone about your life, because it's a remarkable life. Uh, tell them about how you grew up and where, and, and what brought you to, to Harvard and, and to your current position. Um, so as I said, I am a new citizen here. Uh, I uh, was born in Japan and grew up in Italy and in Germany and in Japan and uh, came here for college uh, to Harvard. I was a, uh, because I had gone to high school in Germany, then West Germany, uh, the Cold War and, you know, the the communist threat was very uh, present and so I decided to become a Russia specialist like you. <laughs> um, it was in the air. Uh, so I became a Sovietologist. I fully expected to you know, teach at a university. And then you know, the 1990s came and my unit of analysis fell apart. You know, the, my discipline, political science, 
failed to predict the single most important thing that happened to my unit of analysis, and it was, you know, sort of downhill from there. And I was like, God well, works through all that. Yep, it yep, does, yep. clearly. And I was like, Som something is telling me this is not going to be a, my path. Um, so I joined the World Bank. I knew nothing about the World Bank, but I knew something about Russia. They were hiring Russia specialists. So I ended up spending, you know, some very, like six, seven years working on the Russian reforms. Um, and then went on, to the, the World Bank sent me off to business school, came back, did corporate strategy. And the 2000s came and the first dot com boom, and suddenly it felt like the time when we could completely reinvent flows of international aid and philanthropy. So my co-founder and I uh, started Global Giving, who you, uh, you heard about a little bit before we started. Did that for some 17 years until I got a call saying, hey, there's this job in Jacksonville, would you care to hear about it? And I said, I think I've been to Jacksonville once in my life, but tell me more. So that's how I ended up here. So you're, you're, first of all, you grew up with this incredible international perspective. And I've heard you say before that diversity brings creativity. Would you expand on that a little bit in your life? How have you seen that to be true? Absolutely. Um, so I, with a background like that, I've had to learn to speak multiple languages, but speaking a language isn't all that. You, you can learn languages, um, but interacting in that language with people of that culture, you understand that even the structure of a language, it creates patterns of habits of thought that are different from others. You know, German is a very organized, structured language. You, you know, basically come up for air at the end with a verb. But, <laughs> you know, you, you have to put everything in place and then bang with the verb. And that, that forces a certain level of organization in your head. And you will notice when you go to Germany, it's a very organized place. Um, and... There, there are so many different ways of tackling problems. Even if it is something as simple as, you know, the, the patterns we adhere to in traffic uh, crossings. It's different in Japan, it's different in Germany, it's different in the United States, different in Italy. And there's pros and cons to each approach. And when you have the luxury of having diverse opinions around the table when you're tackling problems, there is nothing better than that because you, someone else will see things that you cannot see. You don't even know that you can't see those things, but they can, and they can point it out for you. So if you can make the time to interact productively with people with different points of view, there is nothing better then why are we so afraid of difference? I think we are, there must be at some animal level things that sort of bring up short. You know, when you interact with somebody of a different culture and they don't look you in the eye because that culture does not encourage people looking in each other's eyes. Suddenly at the back of your mind you're thinking, that person's shifty. They've got something to hide. They're not looking in my eye. And it's not even a conscious thought. You have just internalized that impression without even thinking about it. And I think when you are not aware of the, the many ways in which people's patterns of interactions can be different, you let that subconscious take over. Mm and you start looking at people with just a little bit more suspicion or hesitation. And it takes a minute to train yourself to think, wait, 
maybe they're not sending the message I think they're sending. Let me dig in and find out for sure if they are hiding something or if they really are uncomfortable looking at me. You, it, you owe it to yourself to just pause a beat. Yeah, not react in fear. Yeah. Tell me about this moment, Mari, where you're at the World Bank and somehow you come up with this concept of, of crowdfunding and, and, you, and you take this huge risk of starting this global giving project, which was completely innovative. How did you get there? How did that happen? I mean, you were sort of in a track and you stepped off the grid and did something very creative. So, you know, the, the job I had at the World Bank was corporate strategy and uh, budget formation, but also business innovation. And so I'd had the luxury of looking at the World Bank and saying, why, if it, it's got some of the smartest people in the world, honestly, it's got PhDs from the most you know, illustrious universities, and it is, a, in fact, a very diverse crowd. It, it gets people from all over the world. So the diversity is not a problem, intellect isn't a problem, and money isn't a problem. Why isn't it innovative? Well, it wasn't innovative because it was a quasi-monopoly, and as a quasi-monopoly, you just sort of, business kind of rolls in. There are no competitors to your business. So you're not really on your, on your feet when it comes to looking for business. And over time, it had become fairly bureaucratic. And there was a lot of process embedded in the work of the World Bank, such that people really didn't have to think much anymore. And there were so many processes that were designed to keep the World Bank safe, but were not optimized to support the real work that was happening in the countries that the World Bank was engaged in. We would go on these trips. They were called missions, by the way. A good uh, word, yes. Um, I, I, you know, you, you go into an institution and you're going, oh, when are you going on that mission to Haiti? And of course, you know, that becomes a vernacular. And then the only other place I've heard it is, of course, in places like the Episcopal Parish Network, where like, oh yeah, we're going on a mission to Guatemala. Um, it's, it's a very non-religious institution, the World Bank. So it's actually very strange that mm. their, their trips are called missions, but they are. And um, so we would go on these missions to these countries, and you would meet some of the most creative people doing amazing things under very difficult circumstances. You, they would be in these villages where you know, electricity is randomly on at best. The political forces arrayed against them are such that they have to pay bribes to get anything done. You know, uh, adverse weather events, hurricanes, windstorms, whatever, would come through regularly. You know, roads barely, you know, navigable, but with jeeps. And yet, they would pull together schools, microfinance institutions, you know, self-help groups. The fact that these people were doing things in these circumstances was nothing short of amazing. But the World Bank had nothing to offer these people because they were in the business of sort of channeling sovereign funds, essentially, to, um, to these big problems. Now, there are problems that the World Bank was very well equipped to handle. And then there were a whole host of other things that the World Bank could do nothing about. So that's when, you know, thinking deeply about the problem of innovation at the World Bank forced us to think, well, if we were going to redesign the system to support these people that we see, hundreds of thousands, millions of them all over the world, how would we do it? And that's how we came up with global giving. I will say that as, a, as an entrepreneur, I did learn that because the first dot-com boom was in the 2000s, 
The bus came very shortly thereafter. We started in, at the end of 2000, at what turned out to be the tail end of the dot-com boom, straight into the dot-com bust. And had we started Global Gaming three years later, we probably wouldn't have had to like scrape our way through the, the downturn. So we, we, if we were more seasoned entrepreneurs, we would not have started in 2000. But we started then, and we somehow made it. So, um, so in a way, you bypass the system, and you connect the donor directly to the project. Yes. And you allow this sort of, we would say, spirit-filled, innovative flow of generosity just to sort of happen. Yes. Um, and, and you got started, and how did it grow? Did it just take off on its own? What was that like, to watch that happen? The, the early years were rough. I mean, 2001, most of you were not comfortable putting credit card numbers in on the web. I remember that, yeah. Uh, eBay was king. Amazon was selling CDs. <laughs> <laughs> Facebook didn't exist. Google didn't exist. So it... There was a fair amount of wandering around in the wilderness in the early years. We set up this site. We were sure people would come. And the nonprofits did find us. The donors did not. It was, you know, days would go by with no transactions. And it was, it was pretty miserable. But um, the, the uh, tsunami in Indonesia happened in 2000. And uh, four, and that is when people actually started looking, how do we help fishermen in the Philippines? And we would pop up as a result. Hmm. And you know, it's when the, a very large number of people are moved to give that a platform like Global Giving comes into play because you can find us easily, because we have trusted relationships on the ground, and you know, you're feeling a little uncomfortable about maybe giving to very large organizations like the Red Cross or something like that. So it, it took a lot of trial and error to get to where we are today. It did not automatically happen. But our main hunch that people are fundamentally generous and that people want to help other people turned out to be true. Thanks be to God. Yes. Yeah. So you come to Jacksonville, this city, and I know as dean of this cathedral, it's because of the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund that we were able to start our nonprofit, Cathedral District Jacks, and we've now hailed about 44 million in residential investment into our neighborhood because of your kind of your jump start. So tell us about um, how you view this city. And the Cathedral District sits here, and then the Business District, and then there's this place called La Villa, which you've been very focused on. Tell us about La Villa and, and how you see your role in the city of Jacksonville. So a little bit of backtracking. Jacksonville is a city of about a million people, but it is the largest city by landmass in the United States, some 750 square miles. Uh, it is a consolidated government. Duval County, the 750 square mile entity, is the city. But it's also a city of long standing. It is one of the, it was the southernmost terminus of the Eastern Railroad for quite some time. It's in fact the reason why Mrs. DuPont lived here, because she could get here from mm -hmm. Wilmington on the railway. And, um, you know, it's, it's gone through its ups and downs. And in the, in the Civil War, Jacksonville changed hands eight times. And it changed hands eight times in part because the Union could get there by, by sea. It's a seaport, right? So the Union would come and chase out the Confederates. The Confederates would come then back and forth. And in the Civil War, uh, the, the Union brought many African-American troops here. 
the famous Massachusetts 54th, um, the, the movie Glory, if you remember that. That regiment fought here. Uh, a little west of here is a place called Alusti. In the Battle of Alusti, the Massachusetts 54th fought. So when the Civil War ended, there were many African-American troops, freed now, who chose to stay in Jacksonville. And as luck would have it, they remembered that they had been at this little place that they have bivouacked in called Fort Hatch. Fort Hatch is in today's La Villa. And Fort Hatch became the place where African-American freed soldiers settled. It became the center of African-American life in Jacksonville. And um, there's a historian uh, and urban planner here called Ennis Davis who likes to say, you know, Jacksonville is frequently called the Harlem of the South, but really Jacksonville was a Harlem uh, was Harlem was actually the Jacksonville of the North because we were the ones who born James Weldon Johnson, head of the NAACP, composer, uh, and, well, lyricist of Lift Every Voice and Sing, an Episcopal hymn. Yep. Um, and his brother, James Weld, uh, John Rosamond Johnson, the composer of Lift Every Voice and Sing, were born and uh, grew up here. Augusta Savage grew up in Green Cove Springs, just uh, outside of Jacksonville. She spent a lot of time here. Um, a. Philip Randolph, the uh, labor organizer, grew up in uh, Jacksonville. It was really the great migration that took these incredible people from Jacksonville and sent them up north to Harlem. So in fact, Jackson, Harlem is the Jacksonville of the north. <laughs> And over time, even though La Villa in its day was the densest, you know, most happening place in Jacksonville, had more restaurants, more hotels, more bars than any other part of town. In our wisdom, we put I-95 straight through La Villa. Like many other communities, it went through the African American, the highways went right through the African American community. And then there was, uh, the, uh, ironically, integration destroyed La Villa because now people could go shop anywhere else they wanted, not just in La Villa. Uh, then came you know, the crack epidemic of the 1980s, white flight, and so the inner city uh, became a ghost town. So one of the things we are doing in the name of placemaking and in honoring Jesse's love of place. We are uh, supporting uh, the city to create uh, a, a beautiful signature park in honor of Lift Every Voice and Sing, the hymn, on the site where the Johnson brothers lived. So there's a little spot in La Villa, not far from Fort Hatch, where a, the end, towards the, towards the summer, we should be inaugurating Lift Every Voice and Sing. It's being designed by Walter Hood, the renowned urban landscape designer, uh, MacArthur Genius uh, winner, award winner. And we hope to, to recreate, we cannot recreate what La Villa was like, but we want to recall and help people remember what a contribution the African American community made to Jacksonville, but not only to Jacksonville, to the world really. People like, you know, Augusta Savage and A. Philip Randolph and James Holden Johnson, arguably they're the most famous people to come out of Jacksonville and they changed the world. So we want to, we want Jacksonville to feel proud of that. Uh, so that's one of the things we're doing. Mari, what, what you're talking about can be done in any city and every church we find ourselves in a place with a history and with, yes. with a place and many of our cities have lost themselves though so tell us more about this concept of place making and what that means to you so a, a place is obviously bricks and mortar and real estate 
It has to be. But it, if people do not see it with that lens of what happened in this place all the way back, including to when this land belonged to the Native Americans, right? If we cannot bring that, the whole totality of that place and reanimate that space, then it's just bricks and mortar and grass and dirt. We, we bring significance to it by honoring its history, by recalling it, by weaving it into what happens today. And so I love it when I see proposals from, and many of our grantees at the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund are churches. I love it when they come back and say, look, our, our church, it's used on Sundays and Wednesday evenings. But on other days, honestly, it's, it's empty. We should and would like to get your support in reanimating these spaces so that we can teach financial literacy, hold yoga classes, you know, uh, help feed the poor, put up a food bank in, in, in the areas near our church. We want to animate our spaces so that we do more than hold Sunday services. We love when that happens because that's when an institution like that church is taking leadership in bringing people together and not just its flock, but to all who might need their support and help. Every place has a story, just like every person has a story. Yes. And sometimes we forget that story and we see the, the space as an albatross or a, a drainer of our assets rather than, a, rather than a place that can breathe new life and be filled with activity. So, exactly. Yeah. Well, tell us then about this place called The Jesse. So after this keynote address, we are going to go to The Jesse for lunch which is this incredible space that Mari and the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund have, re have reactivated. So tell us about the history of the Jesse. So uh, the Jesse Ball DuPont Center, which I hope many of you will get to see uh, later today, was originally the Hayden Burns Public Library. It is a mid-century marvel. It's got fins, it's got uh, green and aquamarine tile. It's got glass all over. And um, it was slated for destruction. The, the library moved from uh, our, um, our building to the, um, uh, to Hemming, now James Weldon Johnson Park, which is where City Hall is located. And after they vacated it, the city didn't really have any plans for it. And uh, they put it up for bid. Various people thought about putting a Dave and Buster's in there or tearing it down. And our board, and this is before my time, said, no, you know, we will undertake to buy the Jesse, uh, the Hayden Burns Library and renovate it and turn it into a hub for nonprofits in downtown Jacksonville. So it's essentially class A space, office space, that we uh, rent out to primarily to nonprofits at a subsidized rate. It's significantly below market, but it's enough to help us maintain and um, operate the building. And not only is it office space, it has beautiful, open, wide public spaces. And so we have tried our best. Uh, COVID put a wrench in the works a little bit, but we have tried our best to um, hold art gallery space, to hold public uh, uh, lectures, to host film festivals, to host music festivals in that space because we think that it will, one, help uh, us uh, use the space in, in the way it was meant to be used. It will help our nonprofits 
get access to uh, the people who really need to know about the nonprofits. Could be donors, could be volunteers, all of those things. And we also wanted to create a space um, that exemplified our approach to how we think that by bringing people together, we can be stronger, more creative, and undertake to tackle tougher problems. So it's a work in progress, but I think we're, we're kind of getting there. I hope you will see when you come to our space this many ways in which we try to make the space as welcoming as possible to all sorts of people. And it's a green space, right? Yes, Tell it us is. How, it's, how it's green. What are, what are some of the cool things you're doing with that? So it has passive solar. Our hot water is passive solar on the roof. Uh, it is so well insulated uh, that we are heating and cooling costs, uh, last I checked, were about a third of what other spaces typically consume. Um, it is, um, you know, we have uh, water, gray water uh, capture at the top of our building so that, you know, all the irrigation systems are, um, are use the gray water, the rainwater essentially, that is captured at the top of our roof. And um, all of our lighting is energy efficient. You get the picture. Yeah. One more key thing about you, Mari, is you also describe yourself as a change agent. So one of the things you love to do is go in and help people, help organizations figure out what, what we would call in the, in the Christian tradition, what their call is, what their ins inspiration is, what God is asking of them. How do you do that? How do you, how do you get people to figure out where their future lies? And that that's a that's a really interesting question. I I um, I did a fair amount of change management in large institutions, including at the World Bank. And people fundamentally don't like change. The majority of people don't no like kidding, change. Right. They have figured out how to live their lives. They have figured out how they want to eat their breakfast. They have figured out how they want to work. You move something on their desk and it weirds them out. I mean, at that trivial level, change bothers people. So the only way you can get people to change is to paint a picture of what could be. That is the only way you can get people to change. You cannot tell them stop smoking. You've got to paint a picture of what that life is going to be like when they are alive to see their grandkids and great grandkids because they have stopped smoking. You can't just tell them to stop smoking. You have to prevent a compelling picture of what life could be like and then go back and say, okay, if you want to be there for your great grandkids and play with them, what are you going to have to do now to be there in that future that you see so clearly? So that's why I try to paint a picture of the future. Now, I think about the future a lot. I'm insatiable when it comes to sort of looking at new technologies. Lately, I've been obsessed by chat GPT and how it could completely transform how we work. So I like that thing. I like that sort of thing myself. And that helps when I'm trying to talk to people about change and trying to solicit their, uh, their own image of change. But ultimately, if I'm going to get someone to change, they, the vision they have for the future has to be theirs can't be mine. I can help prime the pump, but they've got to join in and say, oh yeah, and then this, and that, and imagine this. And so, 
you really have to listen to what they desire, what gives them a lift, and start kind of knitting it together. You listen closely about what gives them joy today. You listen closely about what hopes they may harbor. They may not be very forthcoming about their hopes, but sometimes you can tease it out of them. You start weaving it together and say, well, it sounds like you are really excited by this. And they, they're like, yeah. And, and then they'll start building it themselves. Once they've gotten to the stage where they're building that future themselves, you know, you're, you're on the home stretch. You're coasting at that point. But that is how you can get them to turn around and say, oh, well, if I want to get there, I'm going to have to change this. It, but it'll be worth it. It'll be worth changing the present because that future is so compelling. How do you manage the obstacles that come up, the I can't do it or the, the we don't have enough or all of these what ifs? How do you help them get past that um, incapacity to see past the fear or the intractableness that comes with um, not believing in themselves? So there's a time for you know, uh, pressure testing mm -hmm. your strategy. Because once you identify, I mean, I, I spend a lot of time on strategy. My own definition of strategy is you have to figure out where you are. You have to figure out where you want to get to. That's the part I was just talking about, compelling vision of where you want to be. Understand deeply where you are, because even if you know where you want to go, uh, for those of us who used to use maps instead of GPS systems, right? you can't map out a way to your destination if you don't know where you're coming from. So you know, a lot of strategy uh, processes skip the where are you, mm -hmm. and that's a, that's a rookie mistake. Figure out where you want to get to, figure out where you are, and then you figure out the different pathways that get you there, right? When you get to the point of figuring out the pathways, that's when you can sort of let your mind go to, well, what if this happens? What if this happens? So you, you don't want to shut off somebody's very real concerns about what if, and this can happen, and this can be a challenge. You say, hold, hold that thought. Let's park it here. But first, let's get clear on where we are and where we want to get to and the different pathways that we can get there. Once you've got the different pathways mapped up and someone comes up with, oh, well, we can't do that because this person, this bishop is going to be all against this, right? Well, OK, well, then does that mean we should pursue this other path that bypasses that bishop? I don't know. You know, people have different ways of like um, bringing uh, Supreme Court cases, right? They strategically map out which district court they want to go through before getting to the Supreme Court. That's where the strategy comes in. Like, okay, let's get really smart about which district court we're going to bring this suit in. Or, you know, it, it's not like the civil rights movement randomly picked Rosa Parks. They carefully thought through who should bring that suit. And they picked Rosa after a lot of deliberation about all the different people who could bring that suit. In fact, people had brought suits before Rosa had. But the civil rights movement chose to put their money on Rosa because they thought that was going to be their best strategy. So, that's when you allow the sort of naysaying and or challenges. There is absolutely space for that. You just have to bring it in at the right place and time. You don't want to start talking about challenges when you're mapping out the place you want to get to. That's not helpful. But absolutely bring those thoughts and people, because there are some people who are really good at poking holes and who are really good at yes. showing why you know, your strategy sucks. Keep them. They should be part of your team. I mean, this is, a, this is another uh, call for diversity. Don't lock those people out of the room. 
they have their place. Bring them in at the right time when you're pressure testing the different strategies to get there because they will help you figure out the way in which the best strategy to get to where you want to get to. I think we're pretty much out of time. One last question for you. Um, you know, as, a, as an amazing innovator, um, the Episcopal Church, as you heard John Meacham say yesterday, has so much to offer this country and the world. And we are, um, we are sometimes afraid of innovation and change. Give us a last word of, of advice and hope that we can um, bring our wisdom to bear more in the public square and beyond. So, um, I, you've heard me say I'm not, you know, I like, I like change, I like thinking about the future, but I am also not a revolutionary. I believe very much in incremental change, in evolutionary change. And I have a deep, deep respect for institutions and how they hold us together. And you mess around with institutions at your peril. You should not willy-nilly change things about institutions because, oh, well, you know, it's, it, that doesn't belong in our present day. So, and I think the Episcopal Church is one of those institutions that has weathered change incredibly well in a very evolutionary way. I think you bring strengths to the table. Perhaps you fault yourselves for not being as innovative as you could be. And perhaps it is time to kind of push yourself to say, well, maybe it's about time to like think about some more change. But also be confident, I think, that you have a long tradition of sound evolutionary change, the sort of Burkean concept of Yes, we can and should change, and we can and should maintain the trust in our institutions because that trust, once gone, is very, very hard to win back. So I think that you should be even more hungry for and capable of innovation because you have this incredible tradition of having weathered so much evolutionary change over time. You should, you should take confidence from that. Thank you so much for being with us today.